Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the second of four webinars about supply chain solutions organized by IPLU Solutions in the months of September and October. We're very happy that you could join us. My name is Annette Denis. I'm the host of this webinar. Today's topic is the last mile in DRC, the informed push model. In a minute, I'll hand over the virtual microphone to our speaker, Frank Roymans. But first, a few household messages. Um, the webinar will be recorded for training purposes, but your video image will not show on the recording. And during the peer presentation, you will all be muted. If you have questions during the webinar, please write them to Anouk van Praag. She's the co-host of the webinar today in the Zoom chat. All questions will be collected and answered after the presentation. Hopefully we'll be able to cover all of them during this meeting, but any remaining questions will be answered by email should we run out of time. We hope that our internet connections remain stable, but if there is a hiccup somewhere during the webinar, please bear with us. We'll try to solve it as soon as possible. Like I said, our speaker today is Frank Roymans, iPlus Solutions Senior Supply Chain uh, and Reproductive Health Programs Advisor. During his career, Frank has been engaged for more than 15 years in access to reproductive health commodities and medicines in low and middle income countries. Over the last five years, Frank's major focus has been on projects that improve availability of health commodities at the last mile in DRC. I wish you a pleasant time with us and an interesting time. And I now give the word to uh, Ed München, who has been our CEO since 2017. Ed, to you, please. Thank you, Annette. Uh, good day, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to moderate this session, which I think is a very exciting topic about the last mile. Um, we as I plus, if you don't know us, our mission is to save and improve lives by improving global health supply chains. Uh, we do that upstream with uh, the procurement agents for the global funds for their pharma products. Uh, but downstream, I think, is where the real challenges are. And, and we know a lot of these medicines end up somewhere in the middle in central medical stores or district levels, but the last mile I think is our biggest challenge. And if we really want to improve uh, people's lives, we need to fix it. So I'm excited by the topic and uh, let's kick off with Frank. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ed, and also uh, Annette. Uh, welcome to everybody to this, uh, to this session on the last mile. And as Ed already made allusion to, uh, it is really the most fragile and complex part of the supply chain. Um, we will first start with uh, some of the, the background and goals, uh, followed by uh, the informed push model. What did we do and how did we do it? Uh, results and learnings uh, to finish with uh, questions and answers. Next slide, please, Annette. So uh, background and goals. Uh, I, I will be taking you today uh, to the eastern part of the DRC, north and south Kivu, where we have been working as I plus over the last uh, seven years. Next slide, please. Why DRC is, is really a very challenging environment, environment. Why is that? First of all, because of the, the vastness of the, the country. Uh, we have been operating in South and North Kivu. And as you see, only the South Kivu province is similar in size than Burundi and Rwanda together. So uh, it is, it's vast. And also the road infrastructure is, uh, is poor, particularly at the countryside. In Goma, you see uh, a well-developed network of roads, but uh, in most of the other parts, uh, it is really a, a bad situation and uh, particularly challenging when the weather conditions are bad uh, during the rainy season. Uh, so another uh, aspect is uh, the security concerns. Uh, which are dominant in uh, the northern part of North Kivu, the Grand Nord, uh, and where we also see displaced people. Also uh, in, uh, in uh, the, the eastern part of south, some of the areas in South Kivu, uh, and um, uh, also in the north, there has been the, Apol uh, the Ebola uh, epidemic, uh, which has been dominant over the last uh, two years, which has uh, which was very challenging indeed as well from a supply chain perspective. So uh, combined with this external environment, there is also uh, the, the problem 
of uh, the communication. Uh, access to internet is very often uh, an issue, uh, and particularly at the health facility level, there is little access to internet. And uh, another aspect is the low resource environment in which uh, the government needs to operate its clinics with uh, a relatively, uh, yeah, when you end up at the last mile, gradually also the funds uh, are, uh, are, let's say, uh, diminishing. And so it's really a challenge to make the supply chain work at this last mile. Next slide, please. So today's discussion uh, is based on two projects that we have been doing in the Kivus. The first one is uh, Jeunesse 3, which is uh, a consortium that is led by uh, Cordate and that is focusing on uh, the uh, young people and sexual and reproductive health. And uh, it enables, in fact, the focus of this project is to enable them to make informed decisions on their sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, so uh, that is uh, the first project. Second project is the 3C project, which is a, a, a project that we have been realizing with UNFPA, ERC, and is focusing on, on uh, sexual and gender-based violence. It is related to commodities, chain and care, and uh, UNFPA has been focusing a lot on uh, the um, holistic uh, on uh, holistic care of SGBV uh, survivors uh, and also community resilience. And uh, so we as I+, we have been focusing in both projects on the availability of family planning commodities and uh, of uh, SGBV uh, kids. So that was our role and we focused there on uh, the, the health system. Uh, so uh, we have been doing this work in 12 health zones, uh, 156 health facilities uh, and uh, covering a total population of 3.2 million and uh, both projects have been funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands and its related embassies. Next slide please. Um, so what is the pool distribution uh, that is currently used in the DRC? Uh, so in the DRC, pool distribution is generally used between the health facilities and the health zone. Uh, so health facilities, each health facility has to make its way to the health zone level in order to pick up the medicines and family planning commodities uh, at that level uh, in order to ensure availability at, uh, at the health facility level of these products. Uh, that is a challenge uh, because the pickup system is relatively inefficient. Uh, in, in, in an average health zone, you have uh, 20 health facilities. So uh, you need to make uh, the back and forth, you have to go back and forth 20 times uh, from the health facility to the health zone. And very often that is done several times a month because not all the commodities are available at the moment that the health facilities uh, want to pick up at the health level. A second thing is um, uh, that uh, the information exchange, the data exchange that is needed for the health zone to plan the, the distribution and also to order products at the level of the regional distribution centers that information is often too late. It is sent too late from by the health facilities to the health zone. And as a result, there is also uh, a delay in, um, in uh, the health zone to be aware of what's going on at this last mile. Um, as a third element is uh, the, uh, the over, uh, that, that uh, the people at the health facility, particularly the head nurse, is, uh, is uh, over, has, has many responsibilities, and that includes also quite a lot of the supply chain responsibilities, such as stock taking, uh, making sure that uh, the monthly reports are ready, uh, uh, that head nurse is involved in transportation of products, uh, is doing that often herself, he, her or himself, and uh, so, yeah, and, and also this data transfer. So, uh, and on the other hand, the community, the CODESA in, in the DRC has a role in, uh, that is the community base. They have 
the, it's an institutionalized body that is assisting health facilities in all kinds of aspects. And there is an opportunity also for the community uh, base to engage also in helping the health facility in the supply chain. So because of all this situation, uh, we have a stock, we have stock out frequently, excess stock, expiries. We need to redeploy products from one health facility to another and the transportation costs are relatively high. Next slide, please. So what's the objective of this new uh, informed push model uh, at the last mile? It's to fix, in fact, these limitations of, uh, of the pool model. Reduce stockouts, reduce transportation costs, improve stock and consumption data reporting. And on top of that, also do task shifting to enable uh, the head nurse to, to reduce the, the, the workload of the head nurse by enhancing the involvement of the community and by transferring certain tasks to the health zone level, uh, which will also reinforce the ownership of supply chain management at the health zone level. Next slide, please. What did we do and how did we do it? Next slide, please. First of all, our approach is uh, uh, to work with a small team. Uh, you see here the team that, uh, that worked on these uh, two projects. And uh, the, the, the secret of this small team is that we accompany the health system. We are not going to uh, initiate parallel initiatives, parallel reporting systems. We are aligning, in fact, uh, to the national policies of the DRC to what the program national uh, d'approvisionnement uh, is, uh, is uh, in fact um, having as policies. We are not going to change anything. What we are doing basically is to make sure that the supply chain works properly and that and we are accompanying government. Government needs to do the work. We are accompanying. Next slide, please. So first, what we need to do before the informed push model is to get the basics right. Make sure that the, lo the uh, logistic management information system is working properly, that we have uh, supply chain management tools at all levels where they are needed, that people are properly trained, and that they know how to, uh, uh, how to use these management tools in a way that the supply chain is managed in, a, in the right manner. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So what did we change? We, we changed four things. The first thing is that we inverted the, 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 the distribution. So instead of that the health facilities are picking up the products at the level of the health zone, it is the health zone that starts proactively distributing to the health facilities. A second thing what we did is that we, in order to enable the, all this, is to divide the health zones into distribution rounds. So on average, a health zone uh, has uh, 20 health facilities and four to five distribution rounds are being established. Then a, a, sec a third thing is the community involvement uh, through uh, election, electing an IPM focal point and that is responsible for the data exchange and distribution uh, for his or her round. And fourthly, enable the IPM introduction and the functioning because things, uh, yeah, they need to be uh, put in place and there are costs involved in that. Next slide, please. So uh, dividing the health zones into distribution rounds, uh, what we call in French the axis, distribution axis, uh, is that first of all, together with the health zone, the community base and the health facilities, the, uh, we define optimal routes. How many routes do we need in order to efficiently transport products from the central uh, district pharmacy to uh, the health facilities? So, uh, and there also we take into account the degree of complexity uh, of uh, the road infrastructure and also the means of transportation. And because transportation can vary from uh, from uh, uh, motor motorbike uh, to uh, uh, to a bicycle or walking or 
uh, even uh, a pirogue uh, in order to cross the river. So um, those uh, things are mapped out and they will also inform uh, later on uh, the support that is being provided. Next slide, please. So the IPM focal point, he is in fact the link, linking pin between the health facilities of the uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the that are located uh, for each round and the health zone. So um, uh, and so this this focal point is responsible for the data exchange between uh, the health facilities and the health zone. And you see here on this photo, you see uh, what why this data exchange is is needed. In total, there are 10 uh, supply chain management tools that are used at the level of the health facility and at the level of the health zone. And so, um, uh, because there's virtually no internet, uh, these, these data, they need to be transported physically uh, every, at the end of every month between the health facility and the health zone. And that is what uh, the IPM focal point is responsible for. And he is also responsible to organize and accompany the distribution of the products from the health zone to the, to the, to the health uh, facilities. And finally, he is also responsible for document, documentation of all these transactions uh, because they need to be centralized at the level of the health zone also for internal control purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, enabling IPM, that is the third element that we uh, did, is uh, to uh, provide technical assistance and to support the process to implement the informed push model. Uh, meetings need to be organized, uh, uh, these focal points need to be elected, um, and also uh, as, as a team, uh, also the, the, the community base uh, with the IPM focal point and the health zone and the, and the uh, health facilities, they need to understand the process and also they need to work together because that's the solution. And then uh, a second uh, aspect is that we support the health zones in the transportation costs. Uh, and uh, that is not a full coverage of transportation costs, but it is uh, very often a partial uh, help in order to make this work. Next slide, please. So what have been the results and the learnings of the IPM pilot, which we did in the Katana health zone in South Kivu, and we had a control health zone, uh, uh, which is the Walungu health zone. And so um, uh, the, 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 the health zones, they were, they were similar in size, uh, both 20 health facilities approximately, uh, and also they were both trained in uh, organizing their supply chain management. Uh, what we, the only difference between the two is that we implemented IPM in one health zone, in the other health zone, we basically just continued the normal follow-up activities uh, at, at their level. Next slide, please. So what we see here is that the availability of uh, all family planning products, there are nine family planning products that are, uh, have been defined uh, and that are chosen by the government of the DRC. So all these nine family planning products, our objective was that they should all be available at all the health facilities that were part of this pilot. And we started with 35% uh, of the health facilities that had at least, uh, that had all methods available. Um, um, and uh, yeah, we, you see that uh, after uh, four or five months, uh, this increased to 100% of health facilities that all, had all nine products available. Uh, we see a dip in April 2018, and that was due to the spike of the nurses. Uh, but we see that afterwards, gradually, it's picking up very quickly again, up to 100% of the health facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, we see that here in a, in a, in a similar thing, um, uh, the facilities experiencing stockout at least uh, for one product reduced from 80 to 10, so a reduction of 88%, and the facilities experiencing expiries, at least for one product, also reduced significantly from 40 to 10. 
Next slide, please. Uh, the last mile of transportation cost for family planning commodities also uh, plummeted with 60%. Uh, really a significant uh, reduction. And uh, that is obviously because of uh, these uh, distribution rounds that have been defined and that we, we are in fact distributing from one point uh, centrally to five health facilities each in each distribution round. An additional thing that happened was that uh, after a few months, uh, the health facility said, why don't you add some of the essential medicines that are provided free of charge to uh, patients and clients? Why don't you add them to the IPM? And that's what we did. And you see in this next slide that also this had a significant impact on the reduction of the transportation cost for essential medicines. So. Uh, this whole system enables also the bundling of various vertical program products uh, to one single dispatch, which also further decreases the cost of last mile transportation. Next slide, please. So uh, an, another aspect, and that's something really I would like to uh, stress. This is so important. Uh, the timely reporting from health facilities uh, to the health zone. And this is only becoming more important uh, with the introduction of Inform, uh, Informat that has been introduced one and a half year ago with uh, the PNAM in joint collaboration with Global Health Supply Chain Technical Assistance in the DRC. And uh, so this Informat uh, provides the, the possibility to the health zone to key in all the data, the stock data from the health facility level and then uh, uh, providing uh, and then feeding that into the uh, system that will ultimately generate a bird's eye view of what is going on uh, at the last mile with uh, the availability of commodities and not only at health zone level but obviously also at the level of the province and at the level of the national level which is uh, really key not only for uh, uh, knowing where the stockouts are, but also to feed the advocacy that is barely needed in order to cover all the health facilities with sufficient uh, stock. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, IPM improves availability at the last mile. IPM is more sustainable because the costs are being reduced and the, com the community is uh, involved uh, and uh, in an institutionalized manner. It offers opportunity to bundle products at the last mile. The health zones are enabled to take more ownership of their supply chain because they, are, uh, they receive the information and they can take time to analyze and at, the latest, uh, at a few days later uh, to transport what is needed to the health facilities. Community involvement is expanded and uh, the head nurse as a result has more time to focus on other priorities. So in short, improved availability at the last mile at a lower cost. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good story. I think the results are pretty good, especially given the well difficult circumstances in the DRC. But how do you ensure once the product is, project is finished that these activities will continue. So in other words, how do you make it sustainable? Yeah, thanks for, for the question, Ed. It's, it's indeed, it is uh, the key challenge we are all uh, confronted with. In previous products that we, uh, pro projects uh, that we did, a few projects, uh, we were focused, we were confronted with this. Uh, I recall in uh, 2015, we had this uh, SRH Next Generation uh, project and uh, when we stopped after three months, we saw that uh, a number of things, that, that the, the supply chain was deteriorating again. So what we do now, and we are uh, in, in the middle of that process, is we are uh, developing a costed uh, sustainability plan. What does that mean? It means that we are identifying the key components of the program that need to be maintained after the project ends to ensure that uh, the, the health system is, enabling, is enabled 
to uh, continue the gains and the improvements uh, that have been implemented. So that's, that's what we are currently doing. And then obviously, it is uh, the big question is who is going to fund it? Uh, well, uh, that, that could be the government, the provincial government, but very often that is a, a really a big challenge. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we could, uh, and we feel that is also our role, uh, is that we need to figure out who could help us in that regard, government, who could help the government in that regard. Yeah. And that yeah. is the second question uh, that, we, uh, will, that we will definitely uh, go over. What we can say is that it will be a fraction of the overall investment that has been made to improve it. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, let's open the floor for questions. We already have a couple of them coming in. Uh, one is from Amir Karimi. Uh, the question is, how do you capture the distribution cost for the traditional pool model? Um, the, the, it, that has been a, a subject of, uh, of discussion at the moment that uh, we were defining the, um, uh, the distribution rounds. Uh, so we, we looked more in detail at what the costs are to actually move product from, uh, uh, to bring product to the health facilities. So to look at how much these costs are and, uh, and based on also these uh, data, we have also determined part of the support uh, that we have been providing to the health zone. So it is really something uh, that um, it's also a bit of a difficult subject because there are uh, different vertical programs and very often they are financed vertically. Yeah. And so we do not know exactly how much money is going into supporting last mile distribution because yeah. these programs are often not working with each other. But yeah. it's something that needs to be done. Well, thank you, Frank. Um, so if people want to ask questions, please do uh, type them in the, in the chat or, or uh, try to uh, communicate them to us. Um, another question is from René van Eenbergen. Uh, how, really? how are correct transportation and storage conditions secured during the last mile distribution from health zone to health facilities? Well, that's a very good question, uh, René. And, uh, René is one of my former colleagues working for, uh, for MSD. And I know that, uh, and I understand the, the concern for quality. We also have that uh, within I+. Uh, it is indeed a, a very important uh, a challenge. Um, what, we, uh, what we have been doing is uh, that we uh, have protected the products with a, a kind of um, with material uh, uh, when it's, for instance, raining, we are making sure that we have covers in order to that the, the products are not uh, becoming wet. Um, <clears throat> we also, um, uh, for instance, at the level of the health facilities and at the level of the health zone as well, we are also uh, visiting the storage and uh, the storage conditions, and we, we are also either uh, making small investments on behalf of the health facilities. Uh, we look, for instance, at uh, basic things like, uh, is there, can we measure the temperature and humidity, all those things. So uh, we, are, we are defining that, but I honestly, I also need to say, uh, yesterday uh, I received a number of photos uh, from uh, Kamituga in the north of uh, the DRC. And if you see the deplorable state in which uh, certain health facilities are, it is really, uh, really not always uh, easy to do. No, no. Okay. Um, so if there are more questions, please raise them. Uh, I've got one. Um, so uh, if you compare this informed push model, uh, Frank, to the conventional model, what are the differences? Well, the, the, the differences is that uh, um, in a traditional uh, um, push, then basically you are pushing product to the last mile, uh, but in, in but you do not. It, it, it's foggy. You don't see how much you need to push towards that last mile, and the informed push is uh, that the health zone 
they have the information and the data available in order to see how much needs to be distributed. But that means that this information needs to be timely at the level of the health zone and also at the right quality. And that is the effort that we are collectively making in order to ensure that through a statistic program. Yeah, okay, clear. Well, we've got a few more questions coming in. One from Kurain van Olden, who we know quite well. Yeah. So thanks for asking, Kurain. Um, are there any plans to scale this up in the DRC, Frank? Uh, well, it's, it's actually already done, partly. Because after we uh, presented the results of the pilot to uh, the Division Provinciale de Santé and PNSR and some of the other, uh, and, and also our, uh, our colleagues and partners, uh, the decision was taken to upscale it to all the health zones that uh, were covered uh, uh, by the two projects. So at the moment, there are uh, 12 health zones where we have been upscaling this to. And the idea is really to, uh, to upscale it to, uh, to, the, to the level of the province. And secondly, also uh, in the IHP program, in which we are responsible for last mile, the USAID IHP program, there are also uh, in our work plan, there are a number of uh, uh, health zones that we are going to cover uh, in, in the nine provinces in which we are uh, active as uh, USAID IHP. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Kurain. Um, so, uh, a comment from Marco Addis. Uh, thanks for uh, filing the comment. So, it's a bit of a story, so please listen carefully. He says, great ideas and experiences. Key to me is that the health facility needs to have a stake in their performance and access the resources they manage. This will enable them to hire an, an IPM. This could even be a private sector distributor. So no internet, but by SMS would already be an, uh, a good solution. So yeah, I, I think Marco, uh, that's that's absolutely, oh, that's Marco, that's our Marco from Addis, of course. <laughs> I didn't oh, recognize that's uh, our Marco, yeah, yeah, yeah. From, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, great. Uh, could, could you comment on that, Frank? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, a simple SMS uh, would already be very good. Uh, we have, in the project, we had foreseen to implement uh, e-IPM, so uh, with an e-LMIS system. But it was decided ultimately, uh, it was decided ultimately not to implement it uh, because uh, at that time, at a national level, there were already uh, things in motion uh, to uh, put in place in format. It still is required to, uh, to put an ELMIS in place between uh, last mile, so the health facilities and the health zones, but that is uh, for the future. And we are in discussion with PNAM, with, uh, with Director Frank Biai, uh, to see uh, if we can help there. Yeah, and, and on this note, we're currently investigating in a, in a francophone country, I can't tell which one, because it's still confidential, to uh, monitor bed nets and the track and trace them through text messages with SMS, because it's a big mess in that country. Uh, they don't know where the bed nets end up. It's a huge logistical challenge. Uh, but we will connect it through our ELMS system, Medexis, uh, so they can easily track and trace. And that will be probably implemented pretty soon. And the same, uh, uh, we, we investigated in, in Zimbabwe whether we could uh, track and trace COVID commodities for the World Bank. So there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of need for track and trace capabilities with simple, uh, yeah, uh, information uploads from the health facilities, which of course don't have often internet. So well, thank you, Marco, for asking. Yeah, and uh, our blockchain uh, would be a great use. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, uh, we have implemented a, a system in Nigeria where we want to completely uh, track and trace the whole supply chain. And on top of it, also be able that the health facilities pay for the commodities so they don't need to use checks. And we, we're working with an, uh, a blockchain partner, Unchain, in Holland, um, and we try to scale that up. So, uh, yeah, and I think Triggerize, indeed, in Ethiopia, is also doing very good, uh, have, to have good ideas 
how you can use blockchain to to capture the moment that uh, uh, a health activity is done uh, for instance uh, an injection and vaccination um, and and there are impact investors who are interested to see how they can fund these kind of uh, health activities but if you have a proof by a blockchain uh, it makes them for them more uh, interesting to fund it so there are many innovative ideas, which we will have other uh, webinars on. Um, but um, yeah, I can see the enthusiasm um, from, from many actors to improve this, because uh, if you don't have the right data, you can't optimize it. And I think the informed push model you presented, Frank, shows a very practical way to do it. But of course, you want to move beyond the, 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 the paperwork and, and make it all uh, electronic. Um, let me see, are there more questions? Uh, yes, there's one more from Ibrahim Shehata. Uh, do you work with the facilities in improving their inventory management and internal data gathering? Or the assumption is that they are compiling timely data on their stocks? So it's a little bit the same area. Could you comment on that, Frank? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ibrahim, also for this question. Uh, we are, F uh, we are doing that. Uh, we are doing it prior to introduction of the IPM. Uh, we are uh, uh, doing a set, an, ass an assessment. And one of, uh, one of the things that is uh, popping up in these assessments is that there is a gap in terms of uh, training of staff and uh, also of the correct use of the uh, supply chain management tools. So uh, these are input uh, to the training curriculum, and uh, that is then subsequently, uh, we are training trainers at the level of the Division Provinciale de Santé and at the level of the health zones, and those trainers will then train and accompany the health facilities in properly managing their inventories and ensuring also proper reporting, and there when needed, we are supporting the health system to enable that. Okay, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I have one more question to you. Uh, it, it all looks like this informed push model works very nicely and the results are good, but I cannot imagine it all went uh, smoothly. Uh, th these are really difficult circumstances. So what were the biggest hurdles you had to overcome? Well, the, the biggest hurdles, they are more uh, related to the environment in which we operate and uh, as, as I plus, but also the health system. It is, uh, first of all, uh, it is um, uh, the, the, in the northern part and uh, also the, the eastern part of, uh, northern part of North Kivu and uh, the eastern part of, uh, of uh, South Kivu, there are areas where, where there are really security concerns. So you need to make sure that you can uh, uh, do your field visits. Uh, you need to check beforehand which roads you can take. So it is not, not at all that easy. Then uh, in, the, in the north, we also had Ebola. And we have now COVID-19, which is really a challenge when it comes to uh, getting moving around and also uh, doing the, uh, the training, organizing the trainings. Uh, we had to delay some of the trainings and we are now looking at an e-learning opportunity uh, to uh, introduce that uh, at the level of PNAM so that we can do that also, also partly remote. Um, then uh, another thing, and that is what we uh, are working on as well, is the, uh, the, the, the poor low resource environment in which people need to do their job. It is sometimes, you know, it is in terms of motivation, it can be really very difficult for people to be motivated. And uh, so there, we have a role in visualizing what is happening at the last mile and starting to build and start a work on advocacy towards government to uh, jointly with uh, the health system in order to make sure that that improves. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Annette or Anouk, can you maybe unmute everybody? Because uh, I see a remark from Lander van Ommen, uh, which I know from the past. So great to, uh, <laughs> to reconnect again, Lander. Um, 
Uh, you, you have a remark about Burundi, uh, but I'd like you to ask that question yourself. So is it possible to unmute everybody? Yeah, we're doing this. Yes, I'm unmuted. Hi, Ed, and hi, Annette. Hi, Frank. Hi, hi Marco. Um, yes, um, we are at the moment hi, more Lange. or less elite. Hi, we are more or less um, uh, under the radar working with iPlus Solutions. You know the history, and I will not share that now. But um, we are working uh, with Auxfin, which is a similar uh, approach as. Uh, Trigger rise, but it is uh, has a different origin, and it's working fantastically. So at the moment we have a, a platform, a digital platform, rolled out to uh, 400 400,000 households in uh, in Burundi by the end of this year, and uh, that gives an opportunity for uh, very much improved logistics. For it started off with agriculture, but we are now doing it for health and. It's also going to be expanded to other sectors, and it's uh, low uh, low investment. Uh, every household has to pay a certain fee one time, and uh, and for the rest, they can use this system, uh, getting information from it, two uh, G internet, and that is uh, um, of course Burundi is not really completely com comparable to the DRC because it's half the size of South Kivu and it's uh, even less comparable with Ethiopia but it's a good laboratory to test the system mm. and it works fantastically so uh, it's worth the while to to dive into it uh, googling the word Oxwing gives you a wealth of information and the the founding father of it is living in Holland and we yeah. are managing it uh, via an office. No, we, we are not managing, Auction is managing it uh, and the, the office is headed by a Congolese guy, a young Congolese guy. Okay. okay. Well, that sounds really interesting, Lander, and thanks for raising it. Uh, I will definitely follow up on this with you because I think these are the interesting new developments which have potential. So uh, thanks for bringing it up. You're welcome. Yeah. So yeah, if anybody wants to ask or participate, please unmute yourself if possible. I don't know whether it's technically possible, but Lander managed to do it. <laughs> uh, so if anybody else wants to comment or ask a question live, please go ahead. Yeah, if not, um, well, I think we have officially uh, one minute left. So Frank, I'd like to thank you for presenting and doing the great work in the Kivus. And let's see how we can expand that in other countries. Uh, Annette, thanks for the introduction and, and together with Anouk for organizing it. Uh, I think you did a great job. Everything worked smoothly. Um, and yeah, I look forward to connect with everybody and, and our teams in the countries to uh, progress on these uh, interesting developments. So thank you all for joining. And uh, maybe I think Annette is going to do some closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ed. Thank you very much for uh, handling the questions and your introduction. And Frank, thanks a lot for the presentation. And thanks to our audience, of course, for joining and for uh, participating in this, uh, in this meeting. Unfortunately, the time is up. And uh, we really hope that you've had an interesting time with us. We have two more um, webinars coming up, as you can see. Uh, the first one is on the 8th of October. It's on the ELMIS Medexis. We have that one in French and in English, as you can see. And on the 22nd of October, we'll be doing a webinar on the blockchain pilot in Nigeria. So if you're interested in any of these webinars, please follow our communication about it on LinkedIn or just send us an email. That's also a possibility to, to register. Um, we will share with you this presentation that you've just seen. And on the last slide, as you can see, you will find the contact details of uh, Frank Roymans. If you have questions, if you wanna know more about the DRC or the informed push model, you can contact him, no problem. And uh, well, that's it for now. Um, we want to thank you for joining us. Wish you a very good afternoon. And we hope to see you again sometime at one of our other webinars. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you bye. very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Renee. Hello. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, Marco.